A stranger he is called, buried in a remote land, yet men and women stand in amazement of his humility, knowledge and wisdom. Who was this personality? Why is he so special? And why do millions of people visit his burial site every year? One of the contemporary scholars at that time, his name is uh, Abu Salt, used to say that uh, there was no one more knowledgeable than in Ali ibn Musa Rida um, as far as his intellectual accomplishments are concerned and that anyone who would come to debate him would uh, testify to this fact. Uh, in fact, in uh, Shawahid al nubuwa we find in the book Shawahid al nubuwa we find hadith from Imam Musa al-Kadhim alayhi salam who said that I saw the Holy Prophet uh, as well as Amir al-Mu'mineen uh, in my dream and they said to me that you'll be blessed with a son his name will be Ali he will see with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and speak with the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his words and actions are correct and there is no mistake on them he is knowledge personified and this was actually demonstrated in the many debates that Imam Rada alayhi salam undertook um, with uh, different people of uh, different denominations uh, as far as religiosity or otherwise are concerned. As to why these debates took place, the famous debates that the Imam had, uh, one opinion is that uh, Ma'mun loved debate and that's why the debates were organized by him. But a greater part opined that it was because he wanted to humiliate the Imam. And so these debates took place. And as we all know, he managed to defeat the most intellectuals uh, and, and the most experienced philosophers and also the highest authorities from the Sabians, from the Jews, and from the Christians. And they all, they all praised the Imam and they accepted the most knowledgeable person that they had known was Imam Rida. One debate that occurred between Imam Rida alayhi salam and an atheist involved, a man asking him, show me where God is. And the Imam alayhi salam replied back by saying, show me where he isn't and I will show you where he is and the question then followed then where can we find him and Imam Ali Salam said to this man he is everywhere and if he is to be found in a specific place then that restricts him and makes him very much uh, confined to a particular space which does not of course um, mean that he he would be it would mean that he has uh, a limitation and God the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is limitless likewise then he was asked by another atheist tell me what is the proof of the existence of God he said every human being is the proof of the existence of God if you look at the 
makeup of the human being, if you look at the uh, intricacy and the delicate way in which every human being has been created and the uh, very much the setup of the human being as far as his physiology is concerned, you'll come to know that everything was uh, created meticulously by the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and likewise to the cosmos and everything around us and the balance uh, of uh, the creation is clear proof for the existence of the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Once a Christian came to Imam Rada alayhi salam and engaged in this discussion with him and Imam alayhi salam said to him, do you believe in Prophet Isa? He said yes. Imam said to him, we believe that Prophet Isa was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet he was the one that foretold of the final prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And we believe that Prophet Muhammad is the best of all pray, uh, prophets and he used to fast and pray more than all the other prophets of God. So the Christian would be angry and reply to the Imam and say, how dare you say that your prophet is more exalted than our Lord Jesus? And uh, Imam would reply back to him uh, by saying, if you consider Jesus to be your Lord, who is he praying towards? And that would make the Christian. Imam al-Radha would then ask the Christian and say, why do you believe Jesus to be your Lord? And the reply by the Christian would be that he was able to cure the ill and bring back the dead into life and the other miracles that Prophet Isa demonstrated. Imam salam would reply back by saying that there are other prophets of God who had similar miracles to Prophet Isa salam. Prophet Husqil brought back 35,000 people from uh, the state of death towards life. And at the same time, he said al Yasa was able to walk on water and also cure the blind and the leper. So, once this was presented to the Christian, he was not able to refute it. A Jewish scholar, a scholar of the uh, Jewish faith, Imam al-Rada salam also presented his immense knowledge and his diverse um, comprehension. Um, when he said to him, uh, tell me, when it comes to following Musa, why do you follow Musa? He said Musa had many special miracles that he was able to perform. He would split the sea for Bani Israel and uh, at the same time he would turn um, the uh, staff into a serpent and so on and so forth. Imam salam said to him, then why do you not follow Isa? who was able to cure the blind and to uh, give health to the leper. He said, it's because we did not see these types of miracles. Then Imam salam replied back by saying, then how do you believe in Musa? Were you there? Were you able to see these miracles? To which the Jewish man had no reply and uh, immediately said, it is narrated to us as to what happened. Imam salam said to him, if that's the case, then you must accept what is authenticated and related to you uh, about other prophets of God at the same time. Likewise, for example, Zoroastrians, when he would engage in debate with Zoroastrians, they would come to him and say, we believe in Prophet Zoroaster. And he would ask, have you read other, about other prophets? He would be told that no. And he would say to them that this is a limited area of study. You should also understand other prophets who have come and uh, seek knowledge about their lives as well. And therefore, you'll find that any person who presented himself before Imam Rada alayhi salam, and many a times Al Ma'moon was witness to these debates, especially the lengthy debate that took place uh, about the uh, points of uh, contention with regards to the asma, the infallibility of the prophets, whereby uh, Imam Rada salam answered many questions about the asma of Prophet Adam salam, where he said it was tarka'ula, leaving that which was desirable, 
um, when it comes to eating from that tree, when he spoke about Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Nuh, he explained all the misconceptions uh, and many of the questions that were presented with regards to the asma of the Holy Prophets. Established when he was in Mer was the remembrance of Aba Abdullah Hussein. Da'b al was a great poet and the Imam honored him when he recited that long poem, that is the poems that he recited uh, in front of the Imam, honored him with money, honored him with his own cloak, which Da'bal thought was the best present that he could have had from the Imam. It is also said that when the first of Muharram would come, the Imam's tone would change and he would be in a different state, he would be in a mourning state. And for 10 days continuously he would be mourning and he would be having eulogies, as we say, marcias, or noha has been recited in remembrance of his great grandfather. And on the 10th day he would be really saddened and he would tell the people, oh people, this is the day that my great grandfather was slaughtered on the plains of Karbala. Abbasi sent a message to Imam Rada alayhi salam asking him to lead uh, the Salah of Eid al-Fatr. And the Imam initially refused, but al mamun insisted and when the Imam saw the insistence of Al-Ma'moon, he said, By Allah, I will perform the rituals and the salah the way my grandfather, the Holy Prophet of Islam, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, performed it. So he wore white clothes uh, and a white turban, and he left his house barefooted. They saw that all his, his companions and his servants who were coming with him were all barefooted as one. They were all barefooted as well. Suddenly, within minutes, or shall we, within moments, everybody started realizing that we have to dress in the same way as the Imam. Even the commanders who normally would carry small knives, they didn't have time to take their shoes out. They would cut them off because they were made of leather so that they become barefooted as well. And Imam started walking towards the open plain where the prayers were supposed to take place. And every step that he took, he would say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And everybody started joining the Imam. And the whole city was reverberating with the voice of Allahu Akbar to the extent that people thought that even the walls are now saying Allahu Akbar. It was the echoes that were going. to see the Imam in that position, walking towards the mosque in order to perform Salatul Eid. And many people had joined behind him, reciting Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. To the extent that one of the advisors of that moon sent him a message that you must stop Ali ibn Musa, otherwise your rulership is under threat and al Ma'moon sent a message to the Imam that we have tired you and you are, must be exhausted, so you are excused of this particular performance. And Imam salam then immediately put his shoes on, mounted on a horse and returned back to the unhappiness of many people. And at that time al Ma'moon witnessed and this was a demonstration of Imam Rada's popularity uh, within the masses and how he had uh, managed to capture the hearts and minds of people. The Holy Prophet and his family and they saw how pure they were and it didn't take moments for him, people to join the Imam uh, to realize that what he was doing was the best way. Soon after the nomination of Imam Rada alayhi salam to become the heir apparent to the um, Al Ma'moon, there was a severe drought that had, that had affected that area. 
and uh, Imam alayhi salam demonstrated his close proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by leading the salah known as Salatul Istisqa whereby he took a group of people um, and he went to a desert or a land, a mountainous area and he prayed this salah and he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for rain and for sustenance. It was a pulpit that had been prepared and Imam stood there and he gave them a sermon. In the sermon he admonished, he, he gave them nasiha and one of the nasihas he gave them was that you should always respect the bounties of Allah before they are taken away. And he gave them a message before he actually prayed for the rain. After that, he prayed, he did dua, and suddenly people started rushing away. And Imam said, why is it? He says, we can see a cloud coming. Imam said, not yet. That cloud is not for your city. That cloud is for another city. And it went on and on until the ninth or the tenth cloud. After many clouds had passed, an Imam would tell them that this cloud is for that city, that cloud is for that city. When it came to the time that the cloud for Merv was, Merv was approaching, Imam said, this cloud now is for our city. Now run. As soon as people reached their homes, it rained. It rained, it rained, so much so that whatever had been dried up was now back to normal. The rivers had filled up, the springs were full again, and again, the food started growing. This was a miracle of a miracle that happened. All that he tried to humiliate the Imam, he could not do it. He could not, because these were people who had sought refuge in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. These were the people who were representatives of Allah, and these were the people in whose hearts there was no enmity but sincerity. Therefore Allah helped them with us, and no harm could ever come to them. Imam Rudha alayhi salam is known as Gharib al-Ghuraba, the stranger of the strangers, and that is because he was forced to leave his homeland and to go in a faraway land to Khurasan and he was of course buried there in uh, not in proximity to the Holy Prophet and the other Imams alayhim salam who loved the city of Medina neither was he in proximity of Amir al-Mu'mineen his grandfather in, uh, in Najaf or Imam al Hussein in Karbala or the other Imams for that matter in Iraq he's far away therefore he's referred to as the stranger who was also taken by himself and he had to leave his family which was a painful uh, experience at the same time and therefore people remember him and there are special ziyaras whereby this particular title is uh, given that he is Gharibun Rab. <laughs> it's very difficult to understand because um, it's so easy to reach from one place to the other. You have to understand in those days from Medina all the way to, to so Khurasan, it was a long way. In Medina, you had the family of the Holy Prophet, you had the graves of the Imams, you had the grave of the Fatima. Then after that, the other furthest place people went to, for the Prophet's family was, was in Iraq, where they had established for a while in Kufa during the Khilafah of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And Imam Hussein was martyred in Karbala. But then by that, more Imams were buried in Iraq at that time. Imam Husay Qazim was in Karbamein as well. And it was not that far from Medina to Kufa, but to so Khurasan was very far away. And also the fact that Imam Hussein, when he left Medina, he left with his whole family. He had his family with him when he went to Karbala. Whereas in the case of Imam Radha, he went on his own. There was nobody with him. No family. His son Imam Jawad was in Medina. His family was in Medina. His brothers and sisters were all in Medina. And that is why he's known as stranger. 
when he was summoned, he was on his own. So none of the members of the family were with him. Although we know that according to our aqidah, the Imam is not uh, given the ghusl and kafan, but with the Imam who will come after him. And we know that Imam Jawad السلام, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permission and the given of, uh, power given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala managed to come from Medina to attend the funeral of Imam Rida But this was only Imam Jawad and it was something extraordinary. So when we say stranger, it is not stranger like, like rather gharib, they call him gharib. Gharib in a sense that, I mean, he wasn't uh, accompanied or surrounded by Bani Hashim, by his family. And that is the reason for Gharib. Because Gharib in Khurasan, Gharib in Tuz, and so far from Hijaz and Iraq. Imam Rida السلام, left Medina towards Khurasan. He bid his farewell to all his family members, including his uh, beloved sister, Lady Ma'suma, Salamullahi alayha who was very much saddened and grieved by the fact that the Imam uh, was leaving them and was going to a faraway land. And uh, historical narrations point to the idea that uh, uh, she decided later on to join the Imam and to go towards Khurasan in order to meet him. And this reflects the close affinity and the relationship between the Imam Ali Salam and uh, Sister Lady uh, She was a very pious lady, very pious lady. And she had a very strong bond with her brother Imam Rida. Imam Rida wrote a letter to her when he was in Marv, asking her to come and visit him in Marv. And she left Medina, and it was when she had reached Qum, what is today we call Qum, that she found black flags and people mourning, and, and she inquired as to which personality had passed away, because the whole city was in mourning. She was told that it was Imam Rida salam, and she was heartfelt, she was heartbroken. And we say that after a few days, she passed away. And this lady was known for her virtuous characteristics, for her nobility, for her knowledge. And the fact that Imam Rida salam, mentions that whomsoever performs the ziyarah of the grave or the shrine of my sister Lady Ma'suma in Qom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him or her the reward of performance of, of the ziyarah of my shrine. And in other nations it says that heaven will be granted to the person who performs the ziyarah of Lady Ma'suma. Such is the purity of that lady that till today the city of Qum where she is buried and it's because of her that the city of Qum has become the city of scholars. And today you find all the scholars wanting to be in Qum and visiting the grave, the shrine of Janab Masuma. So Lady Masuma reminded people about the knowledge and the wisdom and the illuminous characteristics uh, of uh, her brother Imam Rada alayhi salam and uh, the city of Qum today and its uh, seminary and the hundreds uh, of scholars and maraja who are influential in terms of uh, propagating the message of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam and the uh, knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt uh, are as a testimony to her characteristics and her virtue and her position in the religion of Islam in the eyes of Allah. <laughs>
First and foremost is a way of expressing our allegiance to him. Of course, we can do salams from here and the Imam do here because at the end of the day, it's the sincerity of the heart that is more important than the physicalness of the being. However, the physicalness of the being being near the zarif or the grave of an Imam or the Holy Prophet has a spiritual upliftment as well. And there is a nourishment to the soul as well. Place where an Imam is buried or the Holy Prophet is buried becomes a holy place, becomes a Muqattis place where there are malaikas or angels who descend. And therefore, that environment, spiritually, that environment is a pure environment. And to be there definitely has an effect on us. That is why it is encouraged that we should visit and give our salutations to the Imams and the Holy Prophet by actually visiting the shrines and graves. Because there were many divisions after the demise of each Imam, people, nowadays we have internet. We have uh, the uh, ability to communicate with people, all the intercommunication. For example, uh, the phones, the, I mean, you can, I mean, if somebody dies now in, in my family, I mean, in five minutes time, in 10 minutes time, maybe maximum half an hour, all friends and people are concerned in Australia or in Malaysia or other country and going west to uh, America and to Vancouver, for example, uh, the farthest point, for example, they come to know immediately. When you put the uh, news on the internet, everybody will know about it. Those days, there were no these ways of telecommunication or, for example, internet or uh, the texts or uh, even the, the, the phone calls or the faxes, none of them uh, did exist, uh, exist uh, there. So there was some confusion. Sometimes people would have uh, some uh, wrong ideas about who is going to be the Imam after. So there were divisions as happened like with Zaydiya, who after Imam Zayd Abidin went to uh, think that Zayd ibn Ali is the Imam. After that, uh, the, the Ismailis, I mean, after Imam Sadiq salam, the big division was there, the big rift was there for those who thought that Ismail, after Imam Sadiq salam, will be the Imam and was the Imam, so his descendant nowadays, you know, you know the Ismailis, yeah? Both Al-Khanis and Bukharas. Uh, after Imam Musa al-Kadhim salam, there were Waqifiyas. But, I believe that the first reason that the thawab of Imam Rida is so great is that after Imam Rida no division was there. So whoever accepted Imam Rida as Imam continued to believe until the 12th Imam. The most recommended shrines, again, the Holy Prophet, the Imams. But the numerous hadiths that we have, we have a lot of hadiths for visiting Imam Hussein's grave and also for Imam Qutbah's grave. Ali ibn Abdullah ibn Qurtub, we have a hadith from uh, an Imam Muhammad al-Jawad, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, the son of Imam al-Radha, who says, whomsoever performs a ziyara of the shrine of my father will be granted heaven. And likewise, we have many other hadiths that point to the idea that the za'ir, the visitation of the shrine of Imam al-Rada is equal or more valuable than performance of hajj and other righteous deeds. Therefore, we find this emphasis that is placed when it comes to the performance of the ziyara of the shrine of Imam al-Rada salam, as well as the ziyara of the shrines of the imma, all, of, all in all. And that comes with the ma'rifa, with the recognition and the cognizance of the position of the Imam in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The 
suffering is greater, the suffering is greater, the reward will be great in the same way. And because the suffering of Imam Rida السلام, was there, and people who would go to Ziyarat of Imam Rida would, uh, would be challenged and would face many, many challenges, many problems, many difficulties to reach Mashhad or Khurasan. The reward given to Zawar Imam Rida السلام, is so great that people would benefit from uh, what Allah SWT, uh, promised the believers when they do good to compensate them, to reward them, to give them the best of the thawab. We stand before the Imam's shrine and we say, Arifan bihaqqik, I know and I am fully aware uh, and I acknowledge your position as far as um, the exalted state in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course the ziyara needs to be a life uh, transformation process in the sense that whomsoever performs the ziyara wishes to apply lessons and derive examples from the life of the Imam and uh, utilize it for their own lives and the lives of other human beings in order to ensure that they are of the correct followers of Imam alayhi salam and to benefit from his statements and from the wonderful uh, exemplary nature that he and uh, the rest of the Imams alayhi salam so would always inform their companions as to who the next Imam would be. Because the Imams would have more than one child. And therefore people would want to know who would be the next guide, the next leader. And therefore it became the Imam's responsibility as to who the next Imam would be. And in this same way, the Imam Rada alayhi salam, <coughs> when he left for Mar, Imam Jawad was young at that time seven or eight. <coughs> <coughs> it is narrated that before he left, he took Imam Jawad to the Prophet's grave, Masjid, Nabawi, and had, when he visited the grave, a lot of people were around there and he informed them that after me, this child of mine would be your next. Again, is uh, ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that Imam Jawad السلام, moved from Medina to the uh, uh, place which is now called Mashhad or to uh, uh, what was called in the past in Khurasan or Maru or Tus, whatever names were in the past. Uh, so Imam Rida السلام, directly and in person transferred the Imam and the divine leadership to his son Imam Muhammad Jawad as the ninth Imam. Before he had left to uh, Merv, he would um, gather people around him and would ask them to present their questions to his son Imam al-Jawad who was very young at that time yet he was able to answer all their uh, presentations and all their questions that they had put forward and this demonstrated their knowledge and the fact that he was the successor to Imam al-Rada and when Imam salam was martyred uh, his son was uh, according to some narrations eight or only nine, and he assumed the position of the imamat, um, although some were surprised by his relatively young age, yet others understood that uh, through the answers that he gave, and especially the way he dissected certain um, instructions, such as the famous question or the debate that took uh, place between him, and uh, the Qadi at that time of Al Ma'moon uh, just demonstrated uh, the fact that he was the successor of uh, Imam Rada alayhi salam, of course, chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and announced by his father, Imam Ali ibn Musa. <laughs> Narrations in history point to the idea that Al Ma'moon became uneasy with the presence of the Imam in 
Khurasan in Merv and he wanted to uh, rid uh, the uh, community from the blessing of the presence of the Imam. Therefore, he instructed one of his people to uh, prolong or to make his nails longer and to dig it into uh, poison and then to also do the same into a pomegranate and uh, the juice from that pomegranate was extracted and given to the Imam alayhi salam uh, in a ploy by al mamun who uh, had shown to the Imam that he was ill and not very well and the Imam sallallahu alayhi knew that al mamun would be the one uh, who would be instrumental and in the cause of his martyrdom and he had predicted this to many people Ma'amun had given the poison to the Imam and Imam now realized because the reaction of the poison had started working in his body and he rushed towards his room and as he was entering his companion Abba Salt was outside and he said, Imam, what is wrong with you? He says that now my time is near and I will soon be away from you. As soon as that happens, my son will appear. He will give me the last rites of Ghusl and shrouding that is giving me kafan as well. An Imam is always the one who gives kafan and hustle to another imam. So it's always been the case that the father would be given hustle and kafan by the son who is the imam. In the same way as we know that when the 11th imam passed away and the 12th imam at that time was hidden away from the people because uh, of political reasons, Imam Hassan Naskari never informed people that my son has been born, except the close and the nearest ones. When the time for the namaz came and his brother came to recite the namaz for the 11th Imam, Imam Mahdi appeared at that time and he said, no, it is my right and I will recite the namaz. And Imam alayhi salam, did drink this uh, juice uh, that was given to him by al Ma'moon, narration say, on the 29th of the uh, month of Safar in the year 203 uh, after Hijra. Imam alayhi salam was uh, affected by the poison that spread through his body and uh, he, he was martyred and uh, left this world. And he used to say to people, Ala wallah laqad fa'alu by Allah, they did do it um, just as he predicted and of course where he would be buried would be a land that um, the Prophet the Kifl had uh, predicted to be um, or had prepared to be the, the burial place of one of the righteous servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that area and uh, before him uh, Harun al-Rashid wanted to be buried there but uh, when he was buried there, they tried to bury the Imam there uh, next to the feet of Harun al-Rashid, but the earth uh, would not be dug. And uh, due to the instructions of the Imam, he was actually buried um, not next to the feet of Harun al-Rashid, but uh, um, before the head. In other words, the Imam came uh, before uh, Harun al-Rashid as far as his position in the grave is concerned. And that plot of land was the plot of land that uh, Imam alayhi salam had actually purchased from a man known as Hamid ibn Qahtaba in Khurasan. And the person who came to perform the salah on the body, on the Imam and the rituals was none other than his son, Imam Muhammad al-Jawad al-Taqi salamullahi alayhi. Why? Because we have a narration that only an Imam does these rich rituals of ghusl and uh, burial of another imam so uh, through a miraculous uh, way imam al-jawad came from medina 
he performed these rituals on the body of uh, his father, Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. And of course, it's a time of mourning. Even al-Ma'moon uh, had staged this type of uh, uh, mourning um, for people to cry and to show their grief. Uh, although he was the one who was the cause of the martyrdom of uh, Imam al-Rada salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. So Imam wrote three things to the people. One, he managed to express to the people, show them how to live a noble life through his actions, through his teachings, and through his interaction with the people. And number two, he also enjoined them to get the best of the knowledge, said that they could protect Islam. And number three, was the remembrance of Abba Abdullah. Imam again never took part in the actual politics, but when it came to situations where either the lives of the Muslims or the statehood of Islam was in danger, the Imams never looked at the politics, they would come at the forefront. As we see in the case of our fifth Imam Muhammad Bakir salam, that during the time of Hisham, when there was the issue of the currency where the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine Emperor uh, decided to print coins which would humiliate the Muslims. And the scholars and the ulamas of that time did not know how to react to this. Uh, they all pointed Hisham to one person and was the fifth Imam. Imam never at that time said that, oh, you are an Umayyad Khalifa, you have done this to us, why should I help you? No, because it was in the best interest of the Muslims and Islam. And Imam showed him a way and advised him to set up our own currency, it was Muslim currency, and to the extent that he actually advised him of what metal and what weight and what to actually print on it. Three very nice documents that most of the ulama benefit from them. The first one, what is called Fiqh Rida or Al Fiqh Radawi, when uh, whether it is written by Imam Rida salam, or written by the father of Sheikh Sadu to his son, and it contains the, the, the hadith of uh, uh, Imam Rida salam, from his forefathers. So one of the references, one of the early sources of hadith, we can find it in Al-Fiqh al-Radawi or Fiqh al-Rida, which is uh, the first uh, source we can refer to. The second uh, book is Uyun al-Akhbar al-Rida. Uyun al-Akhbar al-Rida, again written by Sheikh al-Sadu, who died in the year 381 after Hijra as early as uh, the, we can cause it, I mean, about the uh, early days of the uh, formation of the Shiaism, yeah? Uyun uh, Akbar Rida, in which Imam Rida salam had many dialogues, many conversations, many arguments with those who were not in agreement with the Ahl Bayt salam For example, in one occasion when there were the ulama of uh, uh, al-Sunnah in the presence of al-Ma'moon and they spoke about the imama and many things. Imam Rida salam eloquently, very, very eloquently managed to elaborate on the aqidah of Ahl al-Bayt al-Salam which are called as ihtijajat <coughs> or munadharat which means that the dialogue and conversation and arguments which show the strength and the depth of those, uh, uh, I mean, uh, works or those words of Imam Rida uh, There is a third work which is well documented about the medicine or what is called Tibbur Rida, suggestions of Imam Rida salam about the uh, uh, advantage of many herbs, for example, all the way to treat uh, uh, the, the, the ailments and cure those ailments. If we refer to these three in fiqh 
and in uh, dialogues and conversation uh, and to refute the claim of others. And the third one, the, we see that Imam Ali Salam, in addition to be a role model, and he left us a very, very valuable heritage which we can uh, benefit and we still benefit uh, from that. Imam Ali Salam uh, established and taught many students and trained many scholars to be prepared to uh, answer the questions, to remove the ambiguity from many uh, parts of the uh, Islamic teachings and we always indebted to his efforts uh, and an imam as a role model and as an example. At the same time, uh, emotionally, we feel what we are linked to imams alayhi salam because their love is the love of the Prophet and love of Prophet is love of Allah subhanahu wa Lessons we can learn from the lives of all Imams uh, because every Imam had the same qualities although it may not have become apparent because of uh, the atmosphere or the, the, the political environment give as much charity as you can this is the way Imam did but do it in a way silently as much as you can and if you do have to do it openly, do it in such a way that the recipient never feels humiliated that he is receiving charity. Number two, equality. What the Imam taught us is that color, creed, race doesn't make a difference. We're all one at the end of the day. The measure in the eyes of Allah to measure the worthiness of a person is not because of his color or creed, it is because of his taqwa and nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mother of Imam Rabba was a slave. She was from North Africa, a different culture altogether. And not of the lineage that people would want because she was a slave. But she was a pious lady, very knowledgeable lady. And that is why the seventh Imam married Bibi Najma. And to have an, for an Imam to have a mother who was a slave was not a sign of humiliation. To them, humiliation was that if they were not knowledgeable, or they were not near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For them it was a matter of pride that their mother was a worthy person in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, we again, when we, with, it, with our interaction, Alhamdulillah, uh, these days it is less, is that with our interaction with people, we should not look at their race or color, we should treat e e everybody equal. Imam, in all the times where all Imams, and especially Imam Rida salam, were treating people equally. So he never sat on the table as we look uh, for the dinner or lunch without inviting the servants, those who normally would be considered as the lower class in the society, to sit with them to eat with them and not to start eating before they eat. So again, this shows the uh, spirit of Imam Ali Salam is so high and uh, so great that he treats even the servants, even the uh, people who normally are counted as the lower class of the society, treat him in a very, very reasonable and great way. When he was talking, he would talk softly. And that gained him respect. And he would never interrupt it. He would never interrupt somebody when that person was talking until he had finished what he had to say. So again, in order to get respect, 
we have to give respect. And this is what the Imam teaches us, that if you give respect to people, you get respect. <laughs> Shabbat shalom, 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 shalom